or bad. Choosing option A is riskier, but has potentially higher return. An increase in variance also reflects that this new value is further away from the existing data than B. The next section considers these aspects of Gaussian process predictions for Bayesian optimization in more detail. So the class of objective functions called acquisition functions facilitate the trade-off between mean and variance. Recall that predicted variance of the Gaussian process models are mostly driven by how far away they are from existing data. The trade-off between the predicted mean and variance for new candidates is frequently viewed through the lens of exploration and exploitation. And these two ideas are going to be used when constructing a um, expected improvement value, which is uses used to determine which uh, hyperparameter values to use next. So exploration biases the selection towards regions where there are fewer, if any, observed candidate models. This tends to give more weight to candidates with higher variance and focuses on finding new results. So exploration is going to move, it's going to bias towards moving further into an area of great variance. Whereas exploitation principally relies on the mean prediction to find the best mean value. It focuses on existing results. So it knows here that this is the optimal uh, value. So exploitation uh, is going to have the opposite effect of staying near the mean uh, best value. And so you can kind of see uh, there is a there's an illustration here about the mean of the best predicted values versus the variance uh, of the unknown values. So to demonstrate, let's look at a toy example with a single parameter that has values between zero and one, and the performance metric is R squared. The true function is shown below in red, along with five candidate values that have existing results. So we can see that there's a local maxima here, a global maxima here, and another uh, local maxima near the currently best known mean point. For these data, the GP model fit is shown below. Shaded region indicates the mean, plus one or plus or minus one standard error. The two vertical lines indicate two candidate points that are examined in more detail below. So this would be the exploration value, and this would be the exploitation value because it's closer to the mean. The shaded confidence region demonstrates the squared exponential variance function. It becomes very large between points and converges at zero at the existing points. So the larger the distance between, the exponentiality shows in that from that function above. So from a pure exploitation standpoint, the best choice would select the parameter value that has the best mean prediction which would be somewhere right around this currently known one. Here, this would be a value of 0 0.106 just to the right of the existing best observed point at 0 0.09. As a way to encourage exploration, a simple but not often used approach is to find a tuning parameter associated, associated with the largest confidence interval. So that would be right here. For example, by using a single standard deviation for the R squared confidence bound, the next point to sample would be 0.236, right about here. This is slightly more into the region with no observed results, increasing the number of standard deviations used in the upper bound would push the selection further into empty regions. One of the most commonly used acquisition functions is expected improvement. And this is what Tune Bayes use, uses by default. 
Uh, and there's a parameter that you can specify to tune base to change that if you want to. The notion of improvement requires a value for the current best results. Unlike the confidence bound approach, since the Gaussian process can describe a new candidate point using a distribution, we can weight the parts of the distributions that show improvement using the probability of the improvement occurring. So considering the two parameter values of 0.10 or 0.25 indicated by the vertical lines, using the fitted GP model, the predicted R squared distributions are shown below along with the reference line for the current best results. So 0.1, uh, there's a very high density because it's so close to the previous uh, best result. And then with 0.25, there's a very large variance, but not a high prediction for what the um, uh, for the existing. Let's see. Wait, what is density? Does anybody know what density means in this graph? I understand that the expected improvement might only be to here if we choose one that's closer to the mean, whereas if we choose the exploration one, there's a lot greater potentiality for improvement, but also for reduction. Yeah, I'm not sure what density means there, but I guess this part makes sense. When only considering the mean R squared, parameter of one is a better choice, but the parameter recommendation for 0.25 is on average predicted to be worse than the current best. However, since it has a higher variance, it has more overall probability area above the current best. As a result, it has a larger expected improvement between the two. So this is the expected improvement there. And, um, This is not the expected improvement uh, function, like how they arrive at these expected improvement values. I don't know what that is. Um, I was kind of curious. I think there might be a paper somewhere down here quoted that has that information. So this shows the expected improvement graph here, here's the 0.1 very low expected improvement, whereas 0.25 has very high expected improvement. So here it says expected improvement is the default. So the tune base function and all the stuff you really need to know to implement iterative search via Bayesian optimization, use tune base. It has a syntax very similar to tune grid but with several different arguments. Uh, ITER is the max number of uh, iterations. I think the default is 10 or 20, I think it's 10. Initial can be either an integer, which will produce a tuning grid of that length, or uh, an object produced from tuning grid. So if you did a tuning grid first, then you can provide that as the initial values and it will select the best combination as the initial starting point. Or one of the racing functions. So objective is an argument which for which acquisition function can be used. It's either expected improvement or confidence bound. I think the confidence bound is going to be one that might use the like confidence interval like they described up here. So you say if you want one standard deviation or two standard deviations, so you can tell how, it, how much to move into unexplored territory with a confidence bound. 
The parameter info in this case specifies the range of parameters as well as any transformations that are used. It takes a parameters object similar to Tune Grid. Um, if nothing is supplied, it's going to use the defaults for that particular whatever you are tuning. Um, and then the control argument now uses the results of control base. Some helpful arguments there are no improvement is an integer that will stop if no improvements are not encountered in the number of the number that you give it. So if it tries three or four like five times, if you put five there, it will stop. Uncertain, we'll take an uncertainty sample. If there is no improvement within uncertain iterations, this will select the next candidate that has large variation. It has the expect of, effect of pure exploration since it does not consider the mean large prediction. Uh, so this is going to move, is going to, uh, try to move towards uh, greater exploration if it starts to hone in. So you might put your um, no improvement at 10 and you're uncertain at nine, just to make sure it's exhausted um, the uh, area around and doesn't need to explore any further. And then verbose is just logical printing. There is also a parallel over in control base. And I'm not sure why that's there because base is not a parallel thing. It's a sequential function where each iteration uses the previous iteration um, to inform the next candidate value. So I don't know why that argument is there if they're planning on somehow implementing some kind of parallel processing in the future, like maybe exploring multiple areas of high variance at once. But I tried it, uh, and it does not actually use the parallel backend. So maybe that's to come. Um, and yeah, it was, there's no allow par, like allow parallel, like there is with Tune Grid, uh, and as well. So I'm not sure. I guess it's for future use. So a tune base is done here with a 25 as the cap on the iterations uh, with that same SVM model before. And we can see the iterations happening here. And it kind of has a cool thing. If it doesn't give you good results, it'll have an X. And if it uh, improves in that one, it'll give you a heart. And the search continues and it goes from 0.86 to 0 0.90 on the ROC curve. And you can use collect metrics or show best to show the best iterations. And there's an auto plot feature to show the iterations and how it works. So you can see the general like trend towards applying. And then it goes more into exploration here with some values that are pretty far away from the mean. And then you see a trend and then some exploration, lots of exploration. And then eventually coming back to this line here that kind of ended after. So there were. Let's see, how many iterations did they say? Oh, they didn't control for that, but yeah, it came back here and gave up right here. There's also a parameters plot. Animation, this animation is pretty cool. If you all have not had a chance to watch it, I'm gonna play it right now. Animation below visualizes the results of the search. The black X values show the starting values. And then it shows the migration into the areas that are unexplored. 
and it runs in on that. So you can see the migration there. Oh. So one neat feature about tune bays as well, since it can be a very long running process, is if you interrupt it, it will actually save the results and return them instead of losing them. So that's a really nice feature. So simulated annealing is pretty interesting. It's a general nonlinear search routine inspired by the process in which metal cools. I don't understand why. <laughs> I tried to figure that out, but I guess when metal cools, it kind of looks like hot spots and cold spots. Um, so aspects of simulated annealing. Starts with an initial value, and then it creates a, a radius of possible values around it and does like a random walk around that radius to try to find where there is improvement. So a candidate point is resampled to obtain its corresponding performance value. If it achieves better results, it's accepted as the new best and the process continues. If their results are worse, then it may still accept them. And it depends on two factors. First, the likelihood of accepting a bad result decreases as performance becomes worse. In other words, a slightly worse result has a better chance of acceptance than one with a large drop in performance. The other factor is the number of search iterations. Simulated annealing wants to accept fewer suboptimal values as the search proceeds, proceeds from these factors. The acceptance probability for a bad result can be formalized as the probability of acceptance is exponentiation of a user specified constant times the percent difference between the old and new values, where a negative value implies worse results, times i, the iteration number. If the random number is greater than the probability value, the search discards the current parameters and the next iteration creates its candidate value in the neighborhood of the previous value. Otherwise, the next iteration forms the next set of parameters based on the current suboptimal values. And the best way to uh, visualize this is right here. Looking at this really helps to understand how the process works. So it creates all these candidate values in a radius and it does a random walk through there trying to figure out what the next best is. And it turns out that like one right about here is the next best. So it accepts that, creates new parameters, random walk throughout. It finds the next best is somewhere over here. So it accepts that and so on and so forth. And it gradually like moves towards the values that work the best. So they use a GLM net for this example, which has again, two uh, parameters, penalty and mixture. Okay, so there's a nice animation below that is gonna show this process. So let's talk about the function. It's called tune sim anneal. And it's, the normal parameter functions are nearly identical to tune bays. And the control parameters are slightly different though. So we have a no improvement as well for this, which is we'll stop the search if uh, there are no improvements after a certain number of iterations. And even though simulated annealing might accept suboptimal results where the um, performance did not improve, those are still counted towards this uh, cutoff for no improvement. Restart is the number of iterations with no new best results before starting from the previous best results. So this will kind of keep it closer to the mean of best results rather than rather than wandering out into unexplored territory. So biasing towards 
exploitation. Um, radius is a numeric vector from zero to one that defines the minimum and maximum radius of the local neighborhood around the initial point. Um, so I believe this takes like a percentage value and multiplies it by the existing tuning parameter to create that radius. Uh, flip is a probability value that defines the chance of altering the value of categorical or integer parameters. Um, yeah, so that's if you're if you have a some kind of categorical tuning parameter, you can put a probability here for it to change the uh, parameter on new iterations. Um, so if you if you have a particular categorical value that you know is probably the right one, uh, you would put this probability to zero so it doesn't try new parameters for that uh, parameter. And it just sticks with tuning the other uh, you know, continuous hyperparameters. Or if you don't really know and you still want that to be tuned, you could put it as 0.5. And then the cooling coefficient is the is C in the equation that model modulates how quickly the acceptance probability decreases over iterations. So it decreases the probability of accepting a suboptimal parameter setting. So they run it here. This shows the advancement here. It's kind of a normal trend, starts to explore, starts to really explore, and then comes back and then finds some values in here and then ultimately comes back, ends right around here. Also has a parameters. So it shows the iterations and where the parameters uh, are, what the parameters are based on the iteration. And this visualization helps to see how this works. So it kind of moves towards the best value. And up here in the right hand corner, it says what it's doing, whether it's accepting the suboptimal or it's finding new best values. And at least from watching this, it looks like the cooling coefficient, this value up here that decreases the probability of accepting a suboptimal parameter is set pretty high on this because this thing explores quite a bit um, before it restarts from the best, as you will see. One, two, three, four, five. So it does five, I guess, before it uh, comes back to the previous best. So you kind of get how it looks. It kind of looks around the tuning parameter and tries to find a value near it. Kind of wanders around in there for however many times you allow it to before it comes back to the best. So that's how simulated annealing works. Um, and many, this also has the feature of when you manually stop it and interrupt it, you will get the completed results thus far. So 
This chapter describes two iterative search methods for optimizing tuning parameters. Both can be effective at finding good values alone or as a follow-up method that is used after an initial grid search to further fine-tune performance. Okay, so I added this in to the unsupervised uh, parameter search from last week. And we, so I already trained these because it took a while. Um, and I have the results and it was kind of interesting what happened. But we'll take a look at the setup first. So everything's virtually the same, except we use tune bays here. And we set the iterations at 100. We used the previous results. Uh, well, the previous best tuning results. So uh, because this is a time series, we sampled over the resamples, pull workflow set result. Or yeah, we took the best results from the previous tuning grid and used that as the initial starting points for the Bayesian search. And here's that parallel over, does not do anything. Um, but yeah, so did that. And I already went through all this and we have a fitted model with the new results. So Okay, we can predict, find it together, take a look at the metrics. So if we remember last time, it was around like 0.95 almost for the RMSE. So we have almost a 3x improvement uh, in the terms of how the amount of error um, and the R squared is about double from last time. So that's reassuring. However, when we look at the accuracy of whether it predicts accurately, whether it's a positive or a negative value, we totally lost that accuracy. So it now is less than a 50-50 chance of predicting whether the percent change over the course of a week went up or down. It seems to strongly bias towards saying it will go up uh, when it actually is going down a lot of the time. And if anybody knows why that might be the case, please tell me. because I was pretty reassured when I saw there was 90% accuracy for predicting that. Uh, whether, whether the price went up or down over the course of the week. And then once we made it more accurate, slightly more accurate in predicting the actual values, totally lost that accuracy. I think it has something to do with the way XGBoost works, or it could have been a tuning parameter, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Anybody have any questions, comments, ideas? Has anybody used this yet? Uh-oh, I just saw that. I'm sorry, Janita. When did you say that? I hope you didn't say that at the very beginning. No, 2.39, okay. Um, yes. 
Sorry about that. I imagine what you probably wanted to see was the tune base here. Um, so it's it's virtually the same to set up. There's the new arguments iteration and the cutoff. It cuts off at 10 by default. Uh, here, let me open up the help on this so you can see the default values. So there's control bays, there it is. Yeah, so control bays, it defaults to no improvement. It stops after 10. Um, uncertain is infinite, so it, it never uh, does that uncertainty resampling. Um, I might change that value. It can save the GB scoring. I assume that is the expected improvement values. You can save that if you'd like. But yeah. Oh, good. OK, cool. All right. Well, if nobody has any questions, it's time to go play outside or go to work <laughs> if it's Monday. <laughs> or not go to work because it's, oh, well, I don't know if y'all have Memorial Day in New Zealand. And it's raining here. Oh. Well, you could go dance out in the rain. It's very sunny here. So maybe that's why August and um, Luke are not here. Yeah, doing something. And Jason. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, well, thank you for presenting. Uh, Yep, Very I guess good. Luke is going to present next week. I also, uh, we have, they added a bunch of chapters. I don't know if people noticed, um, but they've added a bunch of new chapters. Um, so we've got encoding categorical data, dimensionality reduction, explaining models and predictions. When should you trust predictions, ensemble models, and inferential analysis? So if somebody wants to present on any of those. Um, Stephen, I just checked, and it doesn't look like any of those chapters are there yet. Uh, okay, maybe they plan on adding these chapters. Yeah, so they, 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 they plan on them, and I, I recently watched the talk that Julia gave, and she said, oh, we're busy, we're busy with the, with the dimensionality reduction chapter. So I think it's, it's a, it's literally a thing of like any day, the chapters might come. So I think we kind of need to take it week by week. Yeah, okay. And um, maybe hear what, what um, how, how the other group have approached this. Yeah, well, do they have anything? Because they should be on those chapters. Yeah. So I'm not sure what they've been doing. You know, but... I think... I I think one thing they did is they went back to previous chapters that changed because for them, they didn't have workflow sets. I think in the um, initial, like in a few of the chapters we already did, so they went back and recovered those. Uh, okay. Well, I guess after next week, maybe we take a hiatus until these chapters show up 
and then I'll just send like a message. I'll check back periodically and uh, send a message to the cohort two channel if we want to meet again and go over these. And yeah, I'll tell but, yeah. The only chapter that is already there, um, which I think might be a good idea um, to cover, is the appendix, um, which is the recommended pre processing. Uh. Yeah, yeah, that might be a good thing to look at for sure. I would definitely. Yeah. I was gonna say another thing we could do too is, uh, at, in addition to that, is do um, like applied, you know, examples. You know, like take some of the stuff we've been doing and build out more detailed uh, applications. You know, and just yeah. talk through them. I think that could be helpful. Yeah, yeah, I also think it would be helpful. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely like the edge is taking the stuff and putting it into life in, a, in like a real use case. This is interesting. So what is what do these little circles mean? So, at the honestly, bottom, I, I, and we, we can talk about it this next week, how we should manage it. But honestly, I think this recommended pre-processing chapter is more than an hour's worth of presenting. Um, because it's quite, you know, it's it's quite complex what, they, what they're trying to get across there. And I think that you, you know, you, you kind of need to, I don't know. Um, you kind of need to choose examples of things that people are familiar with. I don't know. Anyway, I, my, my words I haven't loaded yet, so I'm not making that much sense. <laughs> I think I'm going to stop talking. So are you saying for if if we do like apply how to apply this stuff, we should pick uh, like data sets and stuff that people are familiar with? Or, or at least um, just methods that, you, you know, so that, you know, that more than one person presents and that, that they present methods that they're familiar with, um, because that will help with the, you know, with the interpretation of this very cool, um, this very cool um, table that, that, that they have, because they, they don't go into a lot of context. Um, with the table yeah indeed so so you're saying like each person picks you know one that they've used and are familiar with and does like an applied um whoever wants to present does an applied like work up with one of their models that they are familiar with and presents that yep cool yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, okay, well, next week, hopefully we'll have Luke in August and we can run that by them and get it all nailed down for moving forward after that. And yeah, sounds good. Thanks for the ideas. I like it. Okay. Have a good Sunday, y'all. Yeah, thank you. Take care. See you next week. Bye. -bye.